This has got to come down, right? Such power. It's fantastic. Lisa, thank you for your kind words. You've long been a part of my daily routine. And on occasions where we've crossed paths, I've always been impressed with your grace and your gravitas. Ed, to you and your team, thank you for this honor. The day you called to inform me that I'll be joining the PPF honoree family, I was literally speechless. And this is such a rare occurrence that it even caught me off guard. <laughs> to my fellow honorees, I'm humbled to be sharing the stage with all of you. My parents are not here tonight, but if they were, I'd ask you to Stand so you could join me in applauding them. Their unconditional support has been steadfast at every age and stage of my life, including when I was five years old and I hailed a taxi in St. Catharines, even though we were two blocks away from home and we had no money. My sister will tell you that that incident showed that I was going to be a nuisance and be lazy. My parents, however, my parents, however, I know, my parents, however, would say that it was an indication that I was a natural born leader. Clearly, I prefer my parents' point of view. <laughs> I've been a resident of Canada since the age of two and a citizen since 1977. And I wear my love of Canada as a badge of honor. You're quite right. In fact, when I filled out my 2018 tax return, the hardest part was to declare non-resident status because I had then moved to the UK. While living in London and traveling to more than 50 countries over the past 25 years, it's been an enriching experience, and I'm thrilled, though, to be back in Canada. And, as, and yes, we have some challenges, but as Dorothy said in The Wizard of Oz, there's no place like home. What I would add is that sometimes you need to leave your country to see it more clearly. While I realized, what I realized while I was away is that beneath our mild manner beats a superpower that under country, other countries can learn from, and it's really quite simple. Canadians know how to find common ground, to be honest brokers, and to, be, and to build relationships that engage the public, private, and increasingly the social profit and philanthropic sectors. These partnerships may not be perfect, but they take us to places we would not otherwise go. For example, I recall the response that Canada had after the earthquake in Haiti shook the world. Within 48 hours, the government of Canada worked with airline companies, philanthropists, humanitarian agencies, and companies who literally flew water to Haiti. This saved lives. Partnerships are crucial because the greatest problems facing humanity today, safety and security, inequality, disease, climate change, economic instability, cannot be solved by one player. So what compels Canada and Canadians to work in partnership? Is it born out of necessity, given our geography? Perhaps it's because of our entrepreneurial spirit. Or does it come naturally because we are kind? Yes to all three, but most importantly, I believe Canadians are prone to partnerships because we place a premium on inclusivity. This is our secret sauce. While we're not alone in our pursuit and promise of an inclusive society, when it comes to inclusiveness, the world, has a whole, the world as a whole has taken a step back. Over 50 countries are less inclusive today than they were in 2014. In places like the UK, America, France, we are seeing growing intolerance. I raise this because if we want to continue to be a place of hope, of diversity, and progress, we must all be vigilant and protect the values that have shaped our success. I say this as a woman, as a Muslim, as a former refugee, and as a proud Canadian. So how do we ensure that Canada continues to be a leader in partnerships and inclusivity and that we do not follow the path of others? I certainly don't have any, all of the answers, but here are a few suggestions. First, if politicians in the public service are truly serious about producing policies that reflect the people they are meant to serve, then put those people at the center of your policy making. Don't leave them on the margins. We did this at Girls 20 and I can tell you the results have been amazing. Our private sector and government partners directly engaged with our delegates and, a result, and as a result, there are now thousands of girls in leadership positions in their communities and in their countries. And some have even launched their own social enterprises and businesses. And on the flip side, there are businesses and governments doing things differently 
because they welcomed a young woman to their table before making decisions. My second reflection is that business should continue to invest their time and resources into the innovative public and private partnerships, but they should do more to include social profit and charitable entities in their ventures. Research has shown that this would be good for brand and great for the bottom line, as you have said. During my past 15 years working in the social profit space, I've seen the difference when a private sector brings to bear its people, its product, and its profit to solve, of an, to solve a social issues. Last year, I had the opportunity to negotiate a multi-year, multi-million dollar partnership between Malala Fund and Apple. I can say without a doubt, without Apple's intervention, Malala will not be able to reach her goal. And that's not just because of Apple, it's because of all the different companies that have said, we believe in the education of girls. If we are gonna have bold goals, we must have bold partnerships. I will say, and as I do, you alluded to, George, brokering partnerships is a tricky deal. We're not all perfect, but one thing needs to be understood, that to be successful, a partnership must be inclusive of its members, of its team members, and its recipients. It has to be measurable, and it has to be unique to the brand and to the mission. This is a model that's built on inclusivity. My third reflection is that in terms of the social profit sector, I have one message. Inclusivity works both ways. And I hope that social profit organizations and charitable entities will be less suspicious and be more open-minded when a company steps forward to help. My final suggestion might be a little sensitive, but I'd like us to return to a time when consuming media Consuming media in whatever form leads to engagement rather than enragement. <laughs> I'm so done with fake news that sometimes I choose no news. As a former junk news junkie, this is hard to say and even harder to do. I point to this because traditional and new media have really changed the way we interact with one another. What do we believe and what do we take at face value now? Is someone with 10 million followers more credible than someone with 10? Are we taking the time to think? Or are we constantly under pressure to react? And while we're in this non-stop cycle, what is it doing to our ability to be inclusive? In closing, I want to thank PPF for bringing us together this evening. It remains one of my favorite events to attend, not so much because of the wonk party, but because of everyone in the room. PPF has created a space that has and will continue to lead to better policy. And this is good for individuals, it's great for business, it's great for Canadians, and I hope it'll be increasingly great for the world. Thank you very much.